Our current topic is subsequent costs, also called post-acquisition costs, post meaning after. How should these costs be accounted for? We use the same accounting standards for post-acquisition costs as we do for all property plant and equipment, PP&E for short. If the future benefits are expected and the cost can be measured reliably, then post-acquisition costs must be capitalized, meaning it's recorded as an asset and depreciated. Why? Because by applying the same criteria, we have consistency. Keep in mind what future economic benefits means. Post-acquisition costs must increase the service potential of the original asset. What exactly does this mean? It means that only costs which add to the future cash generating ability of the asset can be capitalized, recorded as an asset. It's because those costs provide future economic benefits which flow to the entity. If costs are restoration costs, that means costs which are incurred to return the assets to its normal operating efficiency those costs must be expensed. In addition, normal servicing costs and other maintenance costs don't meet the criteria for capitalization and they have to be expensed as incurred. Remember that these costs keep an asset in proper working condition. They do not enhance it and therefore they must be expensed. There are five major types of post-acquisition costs. Additions, costs which increase or extend the original asset. Replacements, which are when a new part or component are substituted for an old one. Major overhauls and inspections, which are really self-explanatory. Rearrangements and reinstallation, which is when we move assets from one place to another. And finally, repairs, which are servicing costs, costs which we incur to keep assets in good working condition. Let's deal with each of these individually, starting with additions. These are extensions or enlargements, mm, expansions of an already existing asset. Examples would be adding a wing to a hospital or building additional floors on an existing building or adding an air conditioning system to an office building. Additions are capitalized, meaning they're recorded as an asset, and that's because they meet the criteria they provide future economic benefit and their cost is measurable. They are depreciated over the future periods that benefit from their use. Note that additions are subject to component accounting, which we've already covered in a previous video. They can only be added to the cost of the original asset if they have the same useful life and same depreciation method. If not, they are reported as a separate component what about any changes to the existing asset which are caused by the addition? For example, let's say a new addition might mean that the existing foundation has to be reinforced, or it might mean that a wall has to be removed to create access to the new addition. How should these costs of adjusting the existing asset be accounted for? Should they be added to the cost of the old asset or should they be included in the cost of the addition? Any costs that are incurred to change an existing asset because of an addition are added to the cost of the addition as long as the cost is a minor portion of the cost of the original asset. Now let's just explain this with an example. If a wall has to be removed in an original building in order to create access to a new addition, then the cost of the original wall must be a minor portion of the cost of the original building. So we're going back to the original cost of the original wall and the original cost of the original building. That cost of the original wall has to be a minor portion of the cost of the original building. If it is, then the cost of the alteration is added to the cost of the addition. Let me just repeat that. If you incur a cost to change an existing asset to accommodate an addition, the cost is added to the addition as long as the cost of that original wall was a minor portion of the cost of the original building. 
It's important to recognize that component accounting may apply to the addition and that the addition may need to be recorded as a separate item of PP&E. Again, component accounting was covered in a previous video. That's it for additions. Pretty straightforward since they are often recorded as separate PP&E items under component accounting. Let's move on to replacements. Replacements are when an entity removes an original component or part from an old asset and replaces it with a new component or part. It's often because the entity has a policy of modernizing or updating an original asset. Replacing a major part or component of an item of PP&E is sometimes referred to as a betterment. That's because the replacement makes the original asset better in some way, shape, or form, either by extending its useful life, reducing operating costs, or improving its efficiency or effectiveness. That means that it's increasing the original asset's service potential. Let's give some examples. Say an entity replaces all the tires on their transport trucks, or an airline replaces all the seats on their airplanes, or a corporation replaces all the windows in their head office. All of these are examples of replacements. Replacements are capitalized because their costs are measurable and they improve the future economic benefit of the original asset by improving its service potential, its ability to generate revenue in the future. They're recognized either as part of the original asset, but more often as a separate component a separate item of property, plant, and equipment. They are then depreciated over their useful life. But what about the carrying value of the original tire on the trucks, the original seats on the plane, the original windows in the head office? What about the cost of the original part or component? If an entity replaces a part or component, what happens to the original part or component's carrying value, which we know is the original cost less the accumulated depreciation. The carrying value of the original part or component that is being replaced must be written off. Why? Because it has no future economic benefit because it's gone. If the carrying value is known because it was reported as a separate component originally, a separate item of PP&E, then the original value of the component and the related accumulated depreciation is written off. If the carrying value is unknown because it was included in the value of an other item of PP&E, like the windows were included in the building's cost, or the seats on the airplane were included with the total airplane, then the carrying value of the original part or component must be estimated. Note that the cost of the new replacement can be used to help estimate the cost of the old part or component which is being replaced. That estimated cost of the old part or component and the related accumulated depreciation must be written off. I'll provide an example in a separate video. That's it for replacements, so let's move on to major overhauls and inspections. An overhaul is when an asset based on recommendations from either the manufacturer or past experience, is taken apart, cleaned, inspected, and then put back together again. An example would be an airplane engine being overhauled every three years to make sure it's in good working condition. Note that overhauls are sometimes required to keep insurance coverage, or it might just be a policy management has put in place to ensure that things are working properly. An inspection may be part of an overhaul, but may also be a separate check of an asset, completed periodically. It's just to make sure the asset is in good working condition. Again, they are often required for insurance, or it may be part of management's policy, such as the requirement that an air conditioning unit in an office building be inspected every two years to make sure it's working perfectly. If the overhaul or inspection meet the recognition criteria, meaning that it improves the asset's service potential, then the cost can be capitalized and depreciated over its useful life. So the cost is capitalized and depreciated over the time to the next major overhaul or inspection. 
This only happens if the overhaul or inspection lasts for more than one period. For example, if an inspection is completed every three years for airplane engines, then it can be capitalized and depreciated over the three years until the next inspection. Similar to replacements, the carrying value of the previous overhaul or inspection must be derecognized or written off when the subsequent overhaul or inspection takes place. If the carrying value or the original overhaul is not known, then it must be estimated and written off. I'm going to do a separate video with an example of how to record major overhauls and inspections. That's it for major overhauls and inspections. So let's move on to rearrangement and reinstallation. This is when we move assets from one place to another. Why would an entity do that? They might be moving locations, but they may also be changing their processes in order to improve efficiency or the effectiveness of their operation. If these costs will benefit future periods, such as when an entity rearranges and reinstalls their machines to improve raw material flow or make future production more efficient, then we do the same thing as for a replacement meaning that the cost of the rearrangement and reinstallation would be capitalized as an asset and depreciated over its useful life. If the original installation's cost and the related accumulated depreciation is known, both the original cost and the accumulated depreciation are written off. This is exactly the same as a replacement. However, what happens if the original installation cost is unknown because it was included in the cost of the original asset? What happens then? If the original cost is unknown, and note that it is rarely known, and it's often difficult to estimate, then the cost of the rearrangement and reinstallation is expensed in the current period. We are only permitted to capitalize the cost of the rearrangement and reinstallation if we know the cost of the original installation. Otherwise, these costs are expensed. Now that we finished with rearrangements and reinstallation, we can move on to our last post acquisition cost, repairs. Really, we should say not only repairs, but ordinary repairs and maintenance. These are costs incurred to maintain PP&E in good operating condition. Ordinary repairs include parts, labor, and related supplies that are necessary to keep assets in good working condition, but do not extend their useful lives and do not improve their efficiency or effectiveness. Ordinary repairs allow the asset to work as intended, but they don't add to their future service potential. Maintenance expenditures include lubricating, cleaning, adjustments, painting, costs which are incurred to keep assets in good condition. These costs happen regularly, like getting annual oil changes in your car, and they're expensed as operating expenses in the period they're incurred. These costs are often very small expenditures, but they could also be huge, regardless if the cost does not increase the service potential of the asset. If the cost simply returns the asset to its normal operating condition, it has to be expensed no matter how huge the cost is. Even a surprise repair, which are ones that happen because an asset breaks down or they discover a manufacturing flaw. Those costs are expensed in the period they are incurred. That's because the repair returns the asset to its original condition, but it does not improve the expected useful life or efficiency. If there is no improvement to the service potential of an asset, then the cost must be expensed. What if an asset is purchased broken? Well, in that case, the cost of the repair is capitalized as part of the cost of the asset. Why? because the repair does improve the service potential of the asset, and therefore it's capitalized. That's it for the five main types of post acquisition costs, also called subsequent costs. Note that I will be providing two separate videos with examples of replacements and major overhauls and inspections.